The idea of following the editor's kata is that as an editor, you are the maker of the story, right? The script isn't written until you deliver the finished cut. And the flow of the cut, the rhythm, the pacing is really down to you. But the truth is that a disorganized project is not creative. The best post-production begins in actually pre-production. Never mind fix it on in post. I love those t-shirts that say fix it on set. <laughs> so what does that really mean? Well, what it really means in my experience is about 20 minutes of your life pre-organizing the project. And by that I mean create the folders, create the bins, and by folders, let me go back a step, by folders I mean the folders in your storage. And you may not need the folders yet, but it's the folders in your storage, and the bins, the naming conventions that you can use later when you need them, not as you need them. At any given moment while you're editing, ask yourself, if I were to step up from my desk now, or stand back from your standing desk, get back from the desk, pick up my luggage, go to Hawaii, which I've heard is lovely, dance under the moonlight drinking blue cocktails for two weeks, come back, put my luggage down, and sit down at the desk, would I know what's going on? And if the answer is no, you need to get more organized. And the reason you need to get more organized is not because the drive manufacturers will love me saying this, because storage and organization is important. The reason you have to do that is not because you won't ultimately find that clip that you need. It's not because you won't be able to locate your media eventually. It's because creative work is exhausting. It's fatiguing. It requires a very high level of concentration. And anything you can do to reduce the work that you have to do at the point of decision making will actually increase your creativity. It's important to understand the intention that the person had when they were communicating, not the literal translation of the words. If they say it's boring, maybe they mean it's slow. And rather than being angry with them because they said that your cut was boring, help them communicate. Not because it feels good, it's frustrating as hell doing that with people, but because it is the way to get to your finished cut with the maximum flow. And that's the goal here. The goal isn't to be prideful or important or respected, but to do an amazing edit. So if your director says, this kind of sucks, help me understand the word suck in this, <laughs> in this context. Give me, give me a piece of that. Just reframe what they said in your head as if they had said something like, uh, this grade isn't to my taste. And, and I think it'd be really cool if we could talk about um, what the issue is. Just imagine that's what they said, so that when you reply to their statement, all of your nonverbal signals, all of your flow is about, okay, well, let's just get to, get to the issue. It is so much more powerful not to fight than it is to argue and fight. In our society, in our popular culture, it's all about how, how dare you criticize me, you do spill my pint or whatever. I'm going to fight you for that. You've got to respect me. Actually, it's more powerful not to need the respect. Surprisingly, actually, a lot of professional editors, they edit each piece of their project one by one. They get it perfect. That's a terrible mistake in my view because it's so common for you to get three quarters of the way through and discover that because of some issue with your footage, for some reason, you just have to recut and restructure the entire project. You've wasted so much time, so many clicks, much better to treat editing like sanding wood. Has anyone ever sanded wood? You start with your rough, like grade 40. Feels manly. You get that rough, you get the approximation of the finish. And then maybe you do 80, maybe 120. Maybe you go all the way and go crazy for 160. You go for your wet and dry paper, you're going for a glass on the wood. But you don't edit, you don't edit, you don't uh, sand three inches of the wood and then another three inches and another three inches, you sand the entire thing. So my advice is always to go right the way through the entire sequence. Broadly speaking, if the music is over 60 beats per minute, your heart rate will increase. And if it's under 60 beats per minute, your heart rate will decrease. 
Which means, if there's music, your audience is experiencing a physiological, autonomic reaction to the music that they have no control over and changes their perception of time. Are you now setting the rhythm? No. So you can choose to cut ahead, on the cut, or behind. And, you, and you, I hope that all of you have tried this experiment. If you just cut two or three frames before the beat, on the beat, and just after, it does give you either a sense of urgency, a sense of regulated army marching cuts, or a kind of laziness. That's the jazz, right? That's the jazz timing of editing. But you need to know that the music itself is probably setting the beat now, not you. You're responding to it. So even though that rhythm wasn't part of the original footage, it is now part of your film, which is why it's so critical that if you're working with temporary music, it's critical that your temporary music has the same beats per minute as the final music you're going to work with. Sure, the atmosphere of it might change, the mood of it might change, but if the beats per minute changes, you're actually probably going to have to recut when you get the final music. But make peace with the fact that you will never be finished with a creative endeavor. Because I think that creativity is about infinite potential. And you're always going to see ways, as a creative, of improving and finessing and developing it. It's OK. Reach the point where you can't stand looking at it ever again. <laughs> we all know that feeling, right? I never, ever want to look at this again. For me, that's the point at which I know it's done. And that's, I find, when people start saying, actually, this is pretty good. It's really important that you learn to trust your judgment. And the thing about responsibility and being a responsible person is that you are willing to live with the consequences of your choices. And creatively, we're always making choices based on the immediate decision we have to make. And it's usually more productive to instead choose consequences because that's the experience you're going to have once you've made the decision. Earlier, I was talking about negotiation and when somebody is being aggressive or critical or negative. In that moment, what you want to do, your decision should be to fight back, but actually the consequence of fighting back is more conflict. Is that a consequence you want? And in my view, adulthood, which increasingly Adults seem to be becoming like unicorn tears in our society at the moment. I'm very confused about common sense at the moment. But in my experience, the people that choose the consequences they want rather than the immediate choice they would like tend to have a better outcome. And if you respond to someone's aggression by finding out what's wrong with them rather than fighting them back, it's a good chance you'll get to a resolution faster, you'll go home earlier, and you'll produce better work. Which of those outcomes do you want? That's what I mean about trusting your judgment as well. Know that you might get it wrong, but that's OK. You're the one that's going to deal with it. The, the part of your brain that has experiences uh, does not differentiate between something that you experience, remember, dream, or imagine, which means that as storytellers, you're in this incredibly powerful position working with a moving image that if you do it right and you don't draw too much attention to the cuts, not too much attention to the technology, you are literally giving first-hand experiences to your audience. But what are you working with? What's the bricks and mortar of that experience? It's the footage. It's the content. And the critical question is why? If you ask people why enough, why did you wear that shirt? Well, I think it's good to wear a smart shirt. Why is it good to wear a smart item of clothing? Well, I think it's important to, to obtain respect by wearing smart clothes. Why is it important to obtain respect? If you ask why, 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 why enough, eventually you will arrive at one phrase, I feel it. If you ever work on a love story, if you ever work on characters that fall for one another, they don't need to have a reason. I have a script. I won an award for it. It's a great script. Orpheus Rising. Check it out. With any luck, I will raise the finance and we'll make the movie. I found that people who have been in love get it. People who have never actually been in love say, oh, I need more evidence of him being heroic. For her to have a reason to love him. 
And so now I ask them, have you ever felt that part of you is missing when the person you love is not in the room? And they always say no. They always say, it's just for kids. It's Disney movies. So you don't need reasons necessarily, but I feel it is always the ultimate reason. And this applies to everything and every one. And that's the editor's cutter.